we are going to look at the topic. God is speaking. How can I hear him? In the past, God did speak to the Old Testament prophets, but very infrequently. And today, we are actually better off than them because we have God's word to guide us day by day. And so as we began the service with, God's word is meant to be bread for my daily food, not cake for special occasions. This is something I think most ladies would like their husbands to have. <coughs> and maybe even God would like us to have something like this. So how do we get to here? This is a great way of um, picking up extra noise. Uh, in uh, World War Two, they developed the, the, the first one was World War One. Here's World War Two. Things have become much more advanced. And here we've now got four guys and a supervisor trying to hear. Uh, during the Cold War, things sparked up. The Americans were experimenting things like radar, uh, electronic stuff, and we know how infrequently that works. Whereas the Russians were plugged into something that could hear bombs dropping from several thousand feet away. Uh, meanwhile, the British were experimenting with something that actually looked like a big mechanical ear and had a couple of blokes plugged in to try and hear. You might try that if you want to hear God. Mm, there's probably better methods. Uh, dear God, how come I can never hear your voice? I think it's pretty obvious. And we can say, the quieter I become, the more I will hear. You know that's true, don't you? It is. In the busyness of our world, it's easy to drown out God's voice. But Lord, please talk to me. And God answers prayer. And here it is. We have his word. We have the Bible. And it is God speaking to us. And that's what we're going to zero in on today because Jesus' words coming down from the mountain were, among other things, just as it is written. Now, there's just so much in the passage we could pick up. We're going to limit ourselves you're just thinking about the written word and how that impacts on our life as it did on theirs. So several things that we're going to look at. The first point, if you're following in your outline, is this. Jesus has the authority that I need. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. What's the authority? As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen. Now, what had they seen when they were up on the mountain? They had seen that Jesus is Lord, Lord of everything. Jesus is, is Lord because of who he is. And on the mountain, they actually caught a glimpse. Christ Jesus being in very nature God they got to see what he was like, who he is. He is Lord because of who he is. He is Lord because of what he has done. All things were made by him. All things were made for him. That's why he is Lord of everything, because he made everything. He owns everything. It belongs to him. He's Lord because of what he did. Jesus is Lord because of what he will do. God the Father has set a day when he will judge the world. The Father won't do the judging. He will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When anyone stands before their maker, it won't be before an almighty God who doesn't understand. It will be before someone who has walked this earth, someone who knows and understands, someone who is genuinely human. And no one will be able to say, God, it's not fair. You didn't know. You didn't understand what it was like to be one of us. He knows and he understands perfectly. And so he will judge the world with justice. We can be absolutely sure it will be fair when we stand before God. 
Jesus is Lord also because of what he does here and now. For example, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This newness of life is ours because of who Jesus is. He's our Lord. Being our Lord, it makes a difference in our lives here and now. Which takes us on to the second thing that we're going to look at. Jesus gives the clarity that I need. And I do need some clarity in my life to be able to see things clearly, to be able to understand things in particular, to be able to see things from God's point of view, not just my own. Coming down, the disciples ask him, why did the teacher of the law say that Elijah must come first? Now, this is a good question because it was a biblical question. They were asking Jesus a question out of the Bible based on what they'd just seen. They'd just seen Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. The last promise in the Old Testament is God saying, I will send Elijah. And so here it comes. And Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first. Scripture can't be broken. It's always true. But notice how Jesus then goes on and mirrors their question with a much more important one. And that is, why is it written? Again, here we're zeroing in on Scripture. Why is it written that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected? You see how the two questions are laid together, but Jesus passes, well, doesn't pass over, but passes quickly through the answer to the first one to get to the most important question. Hold on to that thought because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. So the question for us, the question for me and for, for anyone who opens the scripture today is how do I read the Bible? How do I interpret the Bible? As a pastor, one of the questions I, I get when trying to talk to people down the street is, oh, look, there are so many different churches. You all have different interpretations. We don't actually. We have different styles of worship, but we all say the, the Lord's Prayer together as we did. But how do I interpret the Bible? We know from the Bible that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture is inspired. All of it. If it's all inspired, where do I start? Do I start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and read through the whole thing? Do I start somewhere else? All Scripture is inspired. Now, Okay, I'm going to put you in my spot. Go down the street. Instead of me being the one they talk to, someone wants to ask you, where do I, how do I start reading the Bible? Where's a good place to start? If you could give someone just one portion of Scripture, not an entire Bible, if you were to give someone just a little bit of the Bible, where would you start? What would you direct them to as the, the best place to get a good handle on what God wants? It's not a trick question? Okay. You're going to go to the Gospels. You're going to go to the words of Jesus. You're going to go to the person of Jesus as the obvious place to start. Good. I was sort of hoping that that would be the answer. <laughs> because... When we go to Scripture, first and foremost, where do we start? We start by listening to Jesus and we go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, to hear what he's got to say. And just as he sat and, and taught when he was on earth, we still need to sit with him and listen to what he's got to say. His friends listened to him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There was no one else that they could go to. We go first and foremost to Jesus. We go to the Gospels in, when we open Scripture. To, that's the best place to begin to interpret it. Even his enemies, the priests, sent the soldiers. They came back empty-handed. Why didn't you arrest him? Well, you see, no one ever spoke 
like this man does. There was something about who Jesus was and how he spoke that made a difference. If we're going to go into scripture ourselves, what better place to start? You've probably seen this. I'm not going to read the whole thing out to you. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. Something amazing about Jesus. But come to this last little paragraph. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as this one solitary life. Jesus has made a bigger difference in this world than anyone else ever has. So how do we interpret the Bible? Smart place is, as you know, you start with Jesus and the Gospels. Where do you go as the second step? To the New Testament letters. And we read things like, in the New Testament letters, we didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So that's why we make that our second step. To those who know, for those who saw it, for those who heard it, for those who have recorded firsthand what it was actually like. So here you've got Peter writing, I was there. I saw it. This is what really happened. Then you get others who were a bit second-hand but who still pick up this eyewitnesses. So, for example, Matthew was one of the 12 apostles. He was there. But Luke wasn't there. He tells us he went back to where Jesus was and he interviewed people and he got first-hand stories from the eyewitnesses and that's what the book of Luke and then volume 2 Acts is all about. It's the eyewitness accounts from those who were there. After listening to Jesus, after going to the New Testament, where do you think you'd go as the third step? Any suggestions? <laughs> oh, you're such a bright group. <laughs> then you can go back to the Old Testament. It's an open book exam, by the way. <laughs> Then you can go back to the Old Testament and hear the stories. Why do we do that next? Well, the New Testament is actually a good place to go to find out why we go to the Old Testament only as third. Uh, for it says, the law, meaning the whole of the Old Testament, is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So why would you start with the shadow? Well, the shadow tells you what's behind it, what's coming, what's being shown out by the light and the Old Testament is that the Old Testament's the shadow but the New Testament is the reality oh, um, in, in this room it'll be fine but this is just a slide for the people listening on, on the internet who don't know that it's okay to be frivolous in church because the next slide's a bit frivolous <laughs> here we are in the office of the Hebrew Publishing Company the editor is reading, This has got the lot. Love, hate, sex, violence, drama, war, hope, fear, incest, intrigue, betrayal, everything that will make it a bestseller. All it needs is a catchy title. I am calling it the Old Testament. <laughs> well, probably not the catchiest title. He should have called it Mission Impossible 1 or something like that. <laughs> it would have been more appropriate. The Old Testament is an interesting read. It's not the first place to start. And then finally, after you've been to Jesus, the New Testament letters, the Old Testament history, then scattered through both the Old and the New Testament is poetry and prophecy. We bump those down to last, no matter where they appear, because while they will give you reality they won't always give it to you in a literal sense. So Jesus says, for example, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now that's a, a lovely poetic turn of phrase, but it's not literal. It's true, it's real, but it's not literal. So that's why we bump these down to, okay, fill in the, the colour once you've got the facts. 
from early on. Uh, and prophecy is a bit literal and a bit poetic. So again, it's um, pushed down to later on so you fit it in with the facts. Okay, we're back out on the street. You're back out on the street. And someone is in conversation with you and, and they say, mm, where did it all come from? This in the beginning stuff. You know, what's it all mean? You know a bit about the Bible, don't you? You went to church. Uh, tell me about the beginning of things. So if someone wants to know how things started off, how are you going to answer them? Over to you. Mm, well, lots of different answers all over the place. Well, look, well, there's a thousand different conversations. Go loose, go wild. Look, you, you, you've got the resources. You can go and do it. In the big Genesis chapter one, verse one, it's not a good place to start. Uh, I know it's in the beginning, but it's not a good place to start because if you start here, you, know, you get down very quickly to there was evening and there was morning, the, the first day, and then the next thing you know, you're into a creation-evolution debate about, well, what are these days? Uh, are they a thousand years? Are they a day? Are they a million years? And suddenly you, you've missed the boat. Well, you can answer them if you're great on science, but if you're not a scientist, then you might be floundering a little. If you want to know in the beginning, remember our four principles? You start with Jesus and the gospel because John chapter 1 begins with in the beginning. So you've got in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So this actually takes us back to before the beginning. This takes us back to why there is a beginning. So this is a much better place because it starts you with Jesus. It doesn't start you with an evolution debate. It starts you with, here is the one who created all things. After you've been to Jesus and the Gospels, where do you think might be a good place to go second? Any suggestions? Wow, what a I'm so glad you came today. <laughs> The New Testament letters are a great place to go next. After you hear Jesus in the Gospels and any doctrine, any topic, then go to the New Testament letters. Here's Colossians 1.16. This doesn't tell us how things are created. It tells us why things are created. All things were created by him and for him. Again, it, it's all about the beginning. It's all about creation. But it's not about debate. It's about Jesus and it's about my response to him. I can't just leave him as a creator out there millions of years ago or a gazillion light years distant. I'm part of this and I'm created by him. I'm created for him. But <clears throat> let's jump from one end all the way to the other. Uh, what about how things are going to wrap up at the end of the world? Where are we going to start? We know, I might be in trouble for this, but I'm in trouble for everything else, so it doesn't matter. 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. We'll meet the Lord in the air. Looking forward to this, it's called the rapture in theological circles. What's the first thing that happens? The dead in Christ will rise first. What's the problem? Where did we not start? We for when we pass over Jesus, we get ourselves into all sorts of hot water. Now it's true that, that is going to happen, literally just like that, it's going to happen. But this says the dead in Christ will rise first. The idea is the Christians get raptured and who gets left behind? All the non-Christians. What does Jesus say? Oh, he actually says the very opposite. He says, 
first collect the weeds. Now notice he goes on and explains what all this means. It tells the parable and then he explains it. First collect the weeds. The weeds are the people of the evil one and tie them in bundles to be burned. So they're the ones who get taken first, raptured first. And gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. That's the wheat. So when Jesus does it, he says... The non-Christians get raptured first and the Christians get left behind. Now, it's actually not a contradiction. It, it does fit together, but it fits together only when you put Jesus first and the New Testament letters second. Well, we can talk about that later. Let's come into the scripture itself. How do you then read the Bible? I mean, these are the steps for interpreting it, but how do you read the Bible? Well, you read it literally when you're reading through a narrative section. Uh, so, for example, um, King Hezekiah rode forth. Uh, it, it actually happened. It's just a narrative section. Read it literally when that happened. Read it symbolically when it's imagery. Jesus says, I am the door, those who come in and out through me. So, obviously, it's talking not as a, a narrative, but something to be taken Literally, uh, symbolically because it's imagery always read it theologically which means what? God centred, Jesus centred we must always keep Jesus to the forefront and read it authoritatively read it with humility this is God's word it comes first not my ideas, not my wishful thinking, not my own spin on things, but come with humility to hear what God himself says in God's word. So as you read it, here are four steps. Read it for your head. These are not necessarily in any order, but this is probably a good order. Read it, first of all, for your head. Read it for knowledge. Read it for understanding. Read it for getting direction for your life so that you, know, you understand what God is saying to you. Read it for your head. Also, read it for your heart. Read it to give you peace. Read it so that you can celebrate who God is and what he's doing in your life. Read it so you capture his vision for you, his vision for the world, your vision for what you could be in him. Read it for your heart. Then, Read it for your hands. Read it because there's action to be done. It's not something just to be left on the shelf. It, the, the point of going through the Bible is so the Bible can go through you so that it gets into your heart, into your head and into your actions so that you get to take initiative, so that what you do, what you achieve is in God's purpose. And then finally, read it for your health. It's a good idea to read it for your physical well-being, but also for that satisfaction that knows that you're part of a design, a grand design to, that integrates you and God and the past and the present and the future all together. Let me give you some examples of this very quickly. You know, reading the Bible for your head, for your understanding. Here's a, a great example. 2 Chronicles 16.1 is probably not a verse you've dwelt on at great length. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, King Bashar of Israel went up against Judah. Now, I gave you that example because that is one of the most exciting verses I have ever read. For my head, my head was just reeling with, with first of all, shock and then with excitement as I burrowed down into what that was saying. That'll be a discussion for over morning tea. <clears throat> but read it for your head to, to get some understanding. It's just narrative. See it as, a, as it literally happened. Read it for your heart. And a great example of that is the 23rd Psalm that everyone knows and rightly loves. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You have to read that with your heart because it's God's heart speaking to your heart. You can take it from your heart and use it in your head as well to help it be integrated because 
let me give you an example. How do you meditate? It, it's not sitting cross-legged and getting yourself all knotted up, contemplating your navel and going on. Uh, when the Bible talks about meditation, it says, come into the scripture. So break it up. Meditate on that. Flick off the telly for half an hour and just concentrate on what this means. The Lord. Concentrate, meditate on the Lord. The Lord. The Lord is. The Lord is my. The Lord is my shepherd. And the more you meditate on every word that God gives, you find this is inspired. This really is not just for my heart. It's for my life. Read the Bible for your hands. In everything give thanks because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Here's an action. There is something to do within all circumstances. Remain with a gratitude attitude. That is something that God calls on us to be obedient to his word. And then read the Bible for your health. An example. Everything was made by Jesus Christ. Everything was made for Jesus Christ. That's for your well-being. Integrate that and you will be integrated into what God is doing. So read the Bible thoroughly and let it thoroughly read through you. The voice of God, it's calling to you. Turn and engage with him. Thirdly, Jesus is the priority that I need. He must be first and foremost. Jesus, the priority that I really do need. And as I highlighted earlier, this is where Jesus takes the Bible question. It was a legitimate Bible question from the disciples. Jesus quickly went through that to come to the key question. And it's always about him. It's always about his death and resurrection. This is what the Bible is about. It's what the universe is about. Jesus replied, Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? He takes them back to these key elements that he's been prompting them about. Why, does, why must Jesus suffer? Well, he must suffer to deal with me, to deal, first of all, with my spirit. My spirit is where you know, I connect with God. Let me take you back in time. This is how everything began. This, this is before the beginning. Remember, in the beginning was? This is before the beginning. There was nothing but God himself. God filled the cosmos, if there was a cosmos. God, God was everything that there is. What do the angels in heaven now sing? This is even before heaven was created. Yeah. But when the angels were created, what do the angels constantly sing in heaven? Holy, holy, holy. Because holiness is what pervades the universe. Holiness is the fabric. Oh, this is beyond the universe. This is eternity. Holiness is what eternity is about. And it's out of holiness. It's out of purity. The, the purest of purity comes the other virtues. Out of holiness comes love. Out of holiness comes mercy and justice and compassion and goodness and kindness. It all radiates out of what the angels sing about. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Everything's about holiness, first and foremost. And then God did something. He did this. Now, this is not a picture of you in the top right-hand corner. This is not even a picture of the earth. This is not even a picture of the sun and moon and planets. This is not even a picture of the Milky Way galaxy with its billions of stars and goodness knows what else. This is a, a picture of the entire universe. This is the whole cosmos with billions upon billions of galaxies. And so big we don't even know where the edge is. We've got no idea where it begins and ends. 
And here it is. It's been blown up about a billion times so that it's big enough for you to see and it's nothing but a dot. God must suffer to deal with my spirit because in that dot is something offensive to God's holiness. His holiness is offended by sin and he has to deal with my sin. He can't pretend that it doesn't exist because that's contrary to holiness. He can't forgive and forget because it goes against the grain of what is holiness. Jesus had to come and suffer and take our sin into himself and die. The fabric of the universe itself is holiness. Sin is an offence against holiness. The wages of sin is death. What I deserve, what I have earned is death, an offence to holiness. And so who must come? It must be the Holy One is the only one who can come and take away my sin and exchange my sin for his holiness. That's why we can be declared righteous in his sight because he has taken sin away. Jesus must also suffer to deal with my soul. My, my spirit is where my sin once resided. My soul is my mind, my personality, my temperament, my, my who I look like. And that's where sanctification happens. Justification happens in my spirit. Sanctification happens in my soul. And I love this photo. The potter's hands take a child's hands to create something new. That's what God is doing. That's what sanctification is. This is God guiding our hands to make us more like himself. He has suffered. He has taken away the negative in order to bring in the positive. Jesus must also suffer to deal with my body. I'm looking forward to a new one. The, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee that there is life after death because Jesus lived it and they've just come down from the mountain where they have seen Moses and Elijah who have been out of this world for century upon century. Death is not the end. So I'm sorry about all the words. This is salvation. All of this is salvation. Salvation in the past is justification. That's what transforms my spirit by freeing me from the penalty of sin which Jesus has taken. It's a legal position declared by God on my behalf and it's a once-time deal. It's a done deal. It happened in the past. It can't be changed. Salvation in the present is sanctification which is transforming my soul freeing me from the power of sin so I don't have to sin I'm learning, I'm growing I'm being filled up with the Spirit it's a growing purity and it's happening all the time salvation in the future will be glorification my body will be transformed freeing me from sin's presence when I step into heaven where sin cannot come. Finally, I'll be perfect. And this takes us way beyond the time itself. That is what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do for us. It takes us on very briefly to our final point. Jesus gives the reliability that I need. And I do need something reliable. I tell you, Elijah's come, and they've done to him everything they wished just as it's written about him. We live in a miserable, messed up world. Scripture is reliable regarding the past. Everything that's written in the Bible, it's true. It's absolutely true and reliable and trustworthy. When Jesus said, Elijah has come, he's saying, it's happened. Sadly, they did to him whatever they wanted. 
sin so pervades this little dot so badly, so awfully, so offensively, that we can't play the music. We are not the music of heaven. We are broken keyed, broken instruments. The world is broken and needs Jesus to tune us back again. And scripture is reliable regarding the future. That as it is written that talks about the past, as it is written that talks about the present, is just as reliable and trustworthy and dependable as everything that is written about the future. Note to self. God's word is meant to be bread for my daily food. Feed your soul on what God is saying and then come on Sunday for cake. (laughs) Jesus is everything I need. In him is everything I need. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Jesus, for everything that he ever has been through eternity past, for everything that he became when he stepped down in humility into this planet, for everything that he continues to be in glory above, for everything that he shall be throughout all eternity future. Thank you for what you have given us. We know that it is written and we depend upon you, your word. You've committed yourself to black and white. Thank you that we can indeed trust you for everything. And so now we look to your word to guide us, for your spirit to fill us, your will to direct us, your love to overflow through us, your joy to lift us, and your life to be our life within and to flow without and all these things we ask in our saviour's precious name amen